Okay, so welcome back after lunch. And we're going to have a talk by Kevin Prabhu on Schur, Schubert intersections and the Murnahan Nakayama rule. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is the mic okay, I think the mic's working. Um, all right, so this is uh, going to be uh, joint work with uh, Jake Levinson, which is uh, quite recent. In fact, uh, when I was writing the abstract for this talk, I wasn't sure if what I was going to be telling you would be called a theorem or a conjecture. Uh, but I want to thank the organizers for giving me the kick in the pants necessary uh, to figure out how everything fit together. Uh, so I think I can call this a theorem now, um, but uh, maybe take that with a grain of salt. Um, in any case, uh, right, so uh, the story begins uh, with the algebra of symmetric functions. Uh, we've seen symmetric functions in uh, quite a few of the talks, but let me just go over a few of the uh, players uh, that are going to play a role today. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, we have the monomial basis for the algebra of symmetric functions. Uh, this, the monomial symmetric functions are basically the simplest ones that you could imagine writing down. Uh, basically, just take a monomial and symmetrize it. So m lambda is the sum of all monomials which have lambda in the exponent. So for example, m31 here, I'm going to be writing most of my partitions uh, just as pictures. Uh, m31 is just uh, x, oops, that's not the right one, uh, is uh, x1 cubed uh, x2 to the 1. That has 3, 1 in the exponent, but so does x2 cubed x1 to the 1 and x1 cubed x3 and so on. So uh, I'm going to be working with symmetric functions in infinitely many variables here, but uh, uh, if you don't like that, you can just imagine that there's a suitably large finite number of variables. Okay. And then next we have the power sum symmetric functions, which are basically just products of monomial symmetric functions. Specifically, a power sum symmetric function is a monomial symmetric function. Uh, so a monomial symmetric function is called a power sum if it is uh, it, if the partition just has one part. So uh, p lambda uh, is the product of the monomial symmetric functions associated to the individual parts of lambda. So P31 is M3 times M1. And finally, we have the Schur symmetric functions, uh, which are uh, defined in many different ways. But here, just for the sake of concreteness, I'll define them to be uh, the generating functions for semi-standard Young tableau. So if we express them in terms of the monomial symmetric functions, uh, the coefficients k lambda mu uh, count the number of semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda and content mu. So for example, the uh, two here, this coefficient of two here in front of the M211 in the expansion of S31 is because there are two semi-standard Young tableau of shape 31 and content uh, 211. Okay. Uh, and finally, we are gonna need the Hall inner product. Uh, so the Hall inner product is an inner product on the algebra of symmetric functions for which the Schur functions form an orthonormal basis. So if I want to compute the inner product of any two um, symmetric functions, what I do is I can express them as linear combinations of Schur functions, and then just use this orthogonality relation uh, here uh, to compute the inner product, okay? So those are the symmetric functions that are gonna appear in this talk. Uh, and what are we gonna do with them? Well, I'm gonna be interested in uh, characters of the symmetric group representations. So for every partition of size n, uh, I have a spec module, uh, which is an irreducible representation of the symmetric group. Uh, and here I'm drawing uh, my SN with uh, a Gothic S uh, for the sake of David Jackson. Um, and, uh, and this uh, representation has a character, which is a function chi lambda. And uh, this maps from, this is a, a map from the symmetric group to the complex numbers. Okay, so how do we compute this map? Well, uh, Frobenius tells us that uh, one way to do this is uh, to use symmetric functions. So if we want to compute uh, chi lambda of sigma for some permutation sigma, what I do is compute the uh, inner product of the Schur function S lambda with the power sum symmetric function P mu, where mu is the cycle type of sigma. Okay, so we get this uh, character formula uh, for this, uh, this function here. 
And okay, that's great. Uh, we've now made this uh, a nice concrete problem. But uh, if you actually want to carry this out, this is, this is maybe not the easiest calculation to do by hand. So uh, the Murnahan Nakayama rule tells us how to actually effectively compute these things. Um, and it says, if you want to compute this inner product, uh, what you can do is take a sum over certain, uh, certain tableau called a border strip tableau. They also go by various other names. Um, but instead of just counting the tableau literally, you have to count them with signs, okay? Uh, so I think this is best illustrated by example. Um, so I'm gonna take my partition lambda to be uh, the partition 442 and mu to be the partition 532. And uh, so what I wanna do is I wanna take the shape uh, of lambda. And uh, since my first part of mu is a five, I'm going to try to fill in uh, a strip uh, consisting of five ones along the inner side of the shape. So there are two ways to do this. I can put my five ones uh, here like so, or I can do it like this. Okay, so those both along, go along the inside of the partition. And then I next I move on to the next part, which is a three. And I try to put a strip of size three uh, that's next to that. And I could do this uh, like this if, my, if I started with this shape over here. Uh, and for this other shape, um, there are two ways I could place the twos as a strip along the inside. Okay. And then finally, uh, I need to fill this out uh, with uh, a strip of size two uh, consisting of threes. And uh, again, there's uh, three ways to do this in total. Okay. And how do we get the signs of the, out of this? Well, the sign of one of these uh, tableau is going to be given as minus one to the number of strips that occupy an even number of rows. Okay, so here, for example, uh, the, oh, that doesn't look right. So this looks like, uh, I apparently have messed up the signs here. Okay, uh, so this one uh, should be a plus because the twos occupy an even number of rows and so do the threes. Uh, I think I've, no, uh, so this one's also a plus and. Okay, this one should be a plus. Oh yes, this should be a plus, okay. Uh, apologies, I seem to have gotten signs. So this one is actually a plus uh, because uh, the twos and the threes both occupy an even number of rows. Uh, this one is a plus because the ones and the twos occupy an even number of rows. And this one is in fact a minus because only the ones occupy an even number of rows. So this, uh, this inner product should be plus one, plus one, minus one. So the sign here should be actually a plus one. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that uh, it doesn't actually matter. The rule doesn't care whether you do this in decreasing order or in, or in some other order. So I could instead think of mu as being uh, two, three, five, and put my uh, strip of ones uh, having size two in first, and then a strip of twos having size three in next, and then a strip of uh, threes having size five in last. And uh, in this case, uh, this should come with a uh, plus sign, and, um, and we get the same answer. And this is interesting because uh, we're getting the same answer despite the fact that there's a different number of terms in these formulas, uh, but they're still giving the same answer, okay? Um, so you can debate whether this is combinatorics. And uh, last week at OPAC, uh, there was some debate about this question, uh, but, uh, but you know, for our point of, for us today, I think, I think uh, this is close enough to being combinatorics. Um, but what's interesting to me is that when I, when I look at this, this situation here where we have uh, a bunch of different ways to compute the same thing and they're coming with plus and minus signs, uh, this to me reminds me of topology. Okay, so in algebraic topology, there are all these topological invariants. And because they're uh, well-defined up to homotopy equivalents, there are a bunch of different ways to compute the same invariant and they may give different formulas. 
uh, but they're all in fact manifestly computing the same thing. Okay. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Jake Levinson and I uh, found that uh, there was actually something like this going on in the case where sigma is an involution. Um, so uh, all of these different ways of performing the Murnahan Nakayama rule are in fact computing the same topological invariant. Um, and, uh, and it's a very nice story. And if I had to give another talk, I would probably tell you about that. Uh, but today I wanna to ask the question, uh, what can we say about other values of sigma, sigma which are not involutions, okay? So um, I'm getting reasonably convinced that there should be some sort of geometric interpretation behind the story in general. And let me just give you a, a sense of what I want from a geometric interpretation. So first of all, uh, I would like to say that the Smyrnahan Nakayama rule is somehow counting certain geometric objects. Okay, so there should be a one to one correspondence between these uh, border strip tableau that appear in the Murnahan Nakayama rule and, uh, and whatever geometric objects I'm trying to count. Okay, and the second thing I want is that the signs should be geometrically natural. I don't want to just somehow take some geometric set of objects and artificially impose some signs on them where I don't understand what the meaning of that sign is in terms of some geometry, okay? Um, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, something like this in the case where the permutation sigma has order, which is a prime power, okay? And it's a very different story from what's happening in the case of an involution, but it, it still satisfies these two criteria uh, that I've laid down. And, uh, and so I, th I think it's actually quite interesting, okay? So uh, in order to tell you about that, I have to talk a little bit about, oh, that was too many, uh, Schubert intersections, which are the other uh, topic of my title. So I'm gonna be looking at Schubert intersections inside the Grassmannian. Uh, the Grassmannian is, uh, you can think of it as just the set of d-dimensional subspaces of an e-dimensional complex vector space, or if you prefer, it's the space which parameterizes the d-dimensional subspaces of an e-dimensional vector space. Um, and uh, this has the structure of a manifold and an algebraic variety. It's a very nice uh, space. Um, and inside of there, there there's these uh, very nice sub-varieties sub called Schubert varieties. Okay, uh, so a Schubert variety is a subset of the Grassmannian, uh, which is uh, determined by two pieces of data. So first uh, piece of data is a partition, and that partition is supposed to fit inside a D by E minus D rectangle. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna assume that D and E are very large numbers here. Uh, D is large and E is even larger. And so this condition, uh, that it fits inside the rectangle is effectively gonna be uh, void for, uh, for all the examples I wanna consider. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because at the end of this slide, I would like all of the calculations that I do not to really depend on D and E. So by the time I get to the end of the slide, uh, D and E are just gonna be completely irrelevant and all the calculations I wanna do are gonna be independent of those two numbers, okay. Um, so the, combin the combinatorial datum is the, this partition. Uh, the other piece of data that I need is a flag. So flags uh, appeared in Mathieu's talk, but just to remind you, a flag is just an increasing chain of vector subspaces. So we have a zero dimensional space sitting inside a one dimensional space sitting inside a two dimensional space where the largest space uh, FE is just the whole vector space, okay? And the Schubert variety is defined to be, uh, well, it doesn't really matter exactly what this definition is. It's uh, defined in terms of conditions that involve the intersection of this vector space with the different pieces of the flag. And there's different dimensions that you can get from considering those intersections and that basically tell you uh, which Schubert variety you're looking at. Okay, um, so uh, I'm gonna do something a little bit funny here. Uh, when I write a subscript on the Schubert variety, uh, this is going to be the definition that I'm going to be using. And this definition has the property that the co-dimension of the Schubert variety inside the Grassmannian is the size of the partition lambda. Um, I also want to use another indexing 
convention where I have a superscript instead of a subscript. And when I write a superscript, uh, it's the superscript Schubert varieties are literally the same thing as the subscript Schubert varieties. They're just indexed differently. So when I write a superscript, it means the same thing as the subscript, but take the complement partition. So take this uh, rectangle here and turn it upside down and, uh, and look at what partition you get, okay? And this uh, gives you uh, a Schubert variety where the dimension is equal to the size of the partition lambda. Okay, and the point of this is that my partitions are going to be small in size compared to D and E. Uh, so what I wanna do is I wanna take a Schubert intersection where I take a bunch of these Schubert varieties and intersect them, but I'm gonna start with uh, one of these guys that has dimension lambda. So that's gonna be have a relatively small dimension. And then each, oops. And then each of these other Schubert varieties, okay, sorry. Uh, each of these other Schubert varieties in my intersection are going to be with this uh, subscript convention. So they're gonna have small co-dimension. So each of these intersections is gonna start with, uh, it's gonna start with some Schubert variety of relatively small dimension. And each of these guys is just gonna cut that dimension down a little bit more. And eventually I'm gonna get down to dimension zero where I have a bunch of points and I can try to count them. Okay. So, uh, so once again, uh, I'm gonna be looking at these Schubert intersections uh, uh, where my Fs here are just gonna be flags and my lambda one, mu one, mu two through mu n are all gonna be partitions. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna assume that uh, the size of lambda is the sum of the sizes of these mu partitions so that my expected dimension of intersection is gonna be zero. Um, and sort of the fundamental theorem here is that if my flags are suitably generic, then, um, then uh, this intersection is actually going to be transverse, which in particular implies that it is actually zero dimensional. And I can try to count the number of points in my intersection. And uh, if I do want to count the number of points, that intersection is given uh, in terms of uh, some symmetric function calculation. Uh, this is just the inner product of S lambda with the product of the S mu i's. Okay. Uh, so the first statement is uh, due to Kleiman, and I'm not sure who to attribute the second statement to. It's sort of like a compilation of like everything that was developed over uh, the last century, perhaps. Um, a basic example of this is if uh, lambda is a partition of n and the mu one through mu n's are all just a single box partition, then uh, this inter the number of points in this intersection is the inner product of S lambda with S one to the n, which just counts the number of standard Young tableau of shape lambda. Okay. All right. So um, that's all fine and good, but uh, it's not giving me the Murnahan Nakayama rule. Um, the Murnahan Nakayama rule, uh, there were no, involves the P's and there were no P's in that story. Okay, so where th that's gonna come from is by considering Schubert intersections, which are not necessarily with respect to generic flags. So I wanna take some rather special flags instead of some generic flags and look at those intersections. Okay, and so now instead of a bunch of discrete points, what I'm gonna get are some points with uh, some non-trivial multiplicity structure associated to them, okay? Uh, and the way I'm gonna do this is uh, with this beautiful story uh, that really dates back to Eisenbutt and Harris and was uh, later studied by Shapiro and Shapiro and uh, Frank Satilli and, uh, and eventually some no very non-trivial theorems were proved by Mukin Tarasov and Varchenko. Um, but I'm not gonna need most of that. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, look at what's called an osculating flag to a rational normal curve. Okay, so uh, a rational normal curve is some uh, very nice curve in projective space. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a point on that curve and I'm gonna get a flag by looking at that point and then taking the tangent space to the curve at that point, which will give me a line. And then looking at the maximally tangent two plane to that curve, which will give me a point inside a line inside a plane. And I can keep doing this until eventually I get all the way up to a full flag, okay? And so my rational normal curve uh, abstractly just looks like 
CP1, which is C union infinity. So I'm going to get uh, such a flag for every element of C and also a flag for uh, the point at infinity. And, uh, and I'm going to be looking at uh, Schubert intersections with respect to specifically these types of flags. Okay, so um, I'm going to use the notation x lambda of a to mean uh, the Schubert variety for the flag f of a. Um, and when I write the superscript, I'm always going to be meaning the flag for the point at infinity. Okay, just to save a little bit of space. Okay, so these are non generic but we still have a similar type of story to what we saw before. Okay, so this is a very nice property of osculating flags. Uh, you can still have a lot of the same stuff that you saw in the generic case. In particular, the dimension of this intersection is always gonna be equal to zero, just as it was before. And the number of points is still given by this intersection. But here, uh, when I say the number of points, I actually mean we have to count points with their appropriate multiplicities. Okay, so a picture here to sort of show you what's going on, a very familiar picture. If we have a transverse intersection of two circles, it meets at uh, two points. If we have a non-transverse intersection of circles, uh, say the two circles are tangent, then their intersection is just one point, but it's a double point. So either way, we can think of this as two points. Now, much worse stuff than this can happen when you're dealing with uh, non-transverse intersections. For example, those two circles could be the same circle, and then you would get an infinite number of points in the intersection. And what I'm claiming is that that doesn't happen in this case of osculating flags, okay? All right, so uh, this is the main example that, uh, that I wanna talk about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my partition lambda to be the partition two one, and I'm going to take my mu partitions to be uh, all just a single box. And I'm going to take uh, my points A1, A2, and A3 to be cube roots of unity. Okay, so one omega and omega squared. And I'm going to consider the Schubert intersection associated to this data. Okay, so uh, according to what I said before, this uh, Schubert intersection should have two points because it's the uh, inner product of S lambda with S one cubed, okay, which is equal to two. And so two points, well, that can either be two isolated points or it could be a double point. It could be one point of multiplicity two, okay? So I wanna try to explain which of those it is without doing any calculations or at least uh, without doing, with doing as little calculation as possible. Okay, so uh, it turns out we can figure this out. All right, so the way I'm gonna do this is I'm going to imagine that I have a permutation, sigma equals one, two, three, uh, acting on, uh, on the complex numbers just by multiplication by omega. Okay, so this is a three cycle and it's gonna act uh, by multiplying by, uh, e to the two pi i over three. Uh, and what this does is it takes a one to a two, it takes a two to a three, and it takes a three back to a one. So that's why I'm thinking of this as the cycle uh, one, two, three acting. Okay, uh, so this uh, nice linear action on the complex numbers turns out in this osculating flags Schubert calculus picture to naturally lift to an action on the entire Grassmannian. And because, uh, Sigma actually fixes uh, my points of interest. Uh, infinity, A1, A2, and A3 are all fixed by this action. Uh, it's uh, this Sigma actually acts on this Schubert intersection. Okay. So Sigma must act on the Schubert intersection. And now we're going to ask the question, what are the Sigma fixed points in this intersection? Okay. So uh, I'm interested in the set of uh, vector spaces V in this intersection, which are fixed by sigma. Okay, well, all right, so this is the intersection we were considering. What is the fixed point set? Well, I can get that fixed point set just by looking at the fixed point set inside my Schubert variety X lambda and intersecting that with any one of these three Schubert varieties. That's the same thing. Okay, but now when you look at that calculation, and uh, uh, you probably wouldn't believe this until you actually just 
you know, grind it out. Uh, you look at the equations that you're writing down and you see that you're staring at a system of linear equations, okay? So a system of linear equations can have at most uh, one solution, okay? And now there's actually only one thing that makes sense uh, given this information, which is that uh, this original intersection I was looking at has to be a point of multiplicity two, and the fixed point set has to be a single point of multiplicity one, okay? And the point is, if I have two isolated points, I cannot have a group of order three acting on that with only one fixed point, okay? But I can do that on a double point. And the way you should think about that is that this double point is kind of like a point with a little bit of fuzz around it. And that fuzz is just big enough so that the point has a tangent space. And what's happening is that sigma is acting non-trivially on the tangent space, but fixing the original point that I talked about. So it only has one fixed point, even though it was a double point to begin with. Okay. That's the intuition you should be having here. Okay, and so uh, we conclude uh, that, uh, that this is the story we're looking at. And I claim that this is related to the fact that uh, this character, chi lambda of sigma, is equal to minus one. Okay. So uh, somehow I should be able to see from the information that I wrote down here that this is the correct character. Okay. Well, one of these is one of one part of the story is something that I've known about for a long time. Uh, there is a paper of mine uh, from uh, 2013 where I showed that if you want to count the number of fixed points of one of these Schubert intersections, uh, what you have to do is you have to count certain border strip tableau, okay? So that, uh, that gives us a connection between uh, this one here and this one here, okay? But what I couldn't figure out for the longest time is where this minus sign was coming from, okay? Um, so long story short, it's coming from the fact that this multiplicity two here is congruent to minus one mod three. So it's one of those things where you have to want to believe that there's an answer in there somewhere before you can actually see it. But once you see it, it's not too hard to see that it's not an accident because uh, this character is computing the inner product of S lambda with P3 and uh, this intersection here, uh, this, this multiplicity here is this uh, this inner product S lambda with S1 cubed, but modulo three, P3 is the same thing as S1 cubed, okay? So this is actually not an accident. All right. All right, so, uh, so you may complain that uh, this was just one cycle acting on, uh, on my story, it wasn't an action of the whole symmetric group. So if I want an action of the whole symmetric group, what I have to do is I have to take the story and move it over to the moduli space of stable curves. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, M0N is the moduli space of smooth genus zero curves with N marked points. So what does this mean? Well, uh, a genus zero curve is just a sphere. It's a CP1. Um, and there's only one of those up to isomorphism. So with n marked points means that I want to choose n points on this, uh, on this curve up to isomorphism. And basically that just means that I want to choose uh, n distinct elements of CP1. And I want to think of them up to isomorphism, which means that I have to mod out by the action of Mobius transformations on the sphere, okay? So, um, if I want to tell you an element of M0N, what I have to do is I have to tell you a list of uh, N complex numbers, one of which can be infinity. And I'm always allowed to have some flexibility in how I choose my coordinates. So I could, uh, if I want, always uh, take one of my points uh, to be infinity. And, uh, and then the other ones would just be uh, some complex, distinct complex numbers, okay? So the problem with this space is that it's not compact. There's an obvious compactification, which uh, you know, just allows these points to collide, 
But it turns out that for various reasons, this is not very good. So it turns out a nicer compactification is look, to look at this moduli space of stable genus zero curves. And what these are, are basically uh, these tree-like structures of, uh, of spheres joined together. Um, and, uh, and we have various marked points and those marked points can be on any different component, okay? And again, if I wanna specify one of these, uh, I just should just tell you where each of these marked points is by specifying some complex numbers. Uh, and telling you which of the spheres it's on. And I should also specify uh, some coordinates for these red points as well. Okay. All right, so uh, David Spire uh, basically extended this osculating flag Schubert calculus picture uh, to a family over, over the moduli space of stable curves. And I'm not gonna tell you exactly how this is constructed, but I wanna give you a little example. Okay, so, uh, so suppose I want to compute the fiber over this curve here. So this curve has two components and uh, I'm gonna call one of my uh, points here infinity. All right, so how do I do that? Well, um, so first of all, I write down a Schubert intersection problem for each of the components. Um, so uh, I'm gonna put uh, an X lambda for my point infinity, which I'm gonna assume is coordinatized to be at infinity. And then I'm just gonna intersect a single box conditions for the two points uh, that are on this component. And then I need a Schubert condition for this node, but I don't know what that is. So I'm gonna end up taking the union over all possible partitions here, okay? And then I do the same thing for the second component. Uh, and here I choose coordinates so that my uh, node here is at infinity and uh, my A1, A, four and A5 are the three uh, mark points here. And again, I put uh, single box conditions for each of these mark points and I use the same new as over here for the node, okay? And when I calculate the total number of points of this intersection, what I'm doing is I'm computing the sum of uh, this inner product. And the point is, uh, since I have an S new and an S new here and I'm summing over new, uh, these all just kind of cancel out and I get an S lambda times S one to the fifth, which is again, the number of standard Young tableau shape lambda. So it doesn't matter what my curve is, I'm always gonna get the same number of points, at least if I'm counting uh, with multiplicities. Okay, so. All right, so here's my next example. Um, I wanna do one of these calculations with uh, one of these uh, stable curves. And I'm gonna take my partition lambda to be this uh, three by three rectangle and my, part, my permutation sigma to be this uh, cycle of length nine, okay? And I've drawn a curve here and uh, I haven't listed where exactly these uh, marked points are, but, uh, but what's happening here is that everything, every point here is going to be coordinatized so that it's either at infinity or one of the cube roots of unity, okay? Uh, so this curve here that I've drawn is actually fixed by the permutation uh, sigma. So you can see if I send one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, uh, five to six, and so on, I'm actually going to get an isomorphic curve. It's just going to be drawn a little bit differently, okay? So sigma is an automorphism of this particular curve. Okay, and now when I write down the Schubert intersection, because I have three nodes uh, here, I'm gonna be taking a union over three different partitions new, and I'll have uh, a different Schubert problem for each of the components and I just take the product of all of these things. Okay, so uh, we can now ask the question, what are the fixed points here? All right, so uh, a fixed point, so, uh, so uh, an element of an element of this uh, intersection is just going to be, uh, since there are four components here, it's going to be a four tuple of elements of the Grassmannian. And when is this fixed? Well, it turns out that this V W1, W2, W3 is fixed if and only if the news are all equal to each other and the Ws are all equal to each other. And then there's this final condition which says that V 
uh, has to be fixed by some permutation and W has to be fixed by some permutation. Uh, but it turns out that because this is a really small example, we can just ignore that last condition uh, just uh, by magic of small examples. Um, okay, and so the fixed point intersection is going to be this, just a, a product of two things. We just have one new now because all the news are equal. Uh, this intersection here uh, times this intersection here, okay? And we have to sum over all possible values of new. Uh, and there are three different possibilities here. New could be this shape uh, three, or it could be two, one, or it could be two. And we can look at what type of intersection we get in each case. Um, in this first column, what we're getting is all of these intersections have multiplicity one, as it turns out. Um, and uh, the number of points is just given by uh, this, uh, this uh, symmetric function calculation. Uh, and in the second column here, which corresponds to this term, uh, we get only terms with one point, but they have non-trivial multiplicities, and that multiplicity is given by this. So this one here was the calculation that we did in example one, okay? And so in total, we can compute the number of points and their multiplicities. So here we get one point of multiplicity one, here we get two points and there have multiplicity eight. And that eight is coming because there's actually three of these twos here from the three components. They all have multiplicity two, okay? And now we're just gonna take the sum of the, these points and assign, the assign to them based on whether this multiplicity is congruent to one or minus one modulo three. And it turns out when we did that, we actually get zero, which is uh, this character evaluation. And again, this is not an accident. I've just written this down here. Uh, it turns out that this it corresponds to some algebraic calculation, which involves plethysm, uh, but I'm not gonna tell you about that. Okay, and so the story is that this works in general. Um, so if we have any partition and any permutation, whose order is a, an odd prime power, uh, then we can look at a curve which is fixed by sigma. And assuming that uh, this, uh, this fixed point set is actually scheme theoretically reduced, uh, we get that the signed, so counting these uh, points of this pre-image of Spire's map with the appropriate signs gives us this character evaluation. Okay, and it turns out that special cases of this uh, are exactly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the tableau that you get in the Murnahan-Nakayama rule. And then there are these other calculations which uh, aren't the Murnahan-Nakayama rule. I don't know if there's some well-known generalization of the Murnahan-Nakayama rule that they correspond to, uh, but uh, that's the end of our story. So thank you very much. So just before I call for questions, I'll say there's going to be an announcement after the questions. So don't charge for coffee as soon as we applaud the second time. Okay, so we have some questions for Kevin. I have one. So this might be too hard, but um, do you have any in intuition for a skew version? Oh, yeah, this all works skew as well. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, that's trivial. <laughs> I just, it just, it's, you know, it, it adds extra complexity to the slides. So I, oh, okay. yeah. Any questions, other questions? Okay, so we'll thank Kevin again and then Alejandro has an announcement.